afternoon, everyone. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and answers. Question one, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact in Scotland would be of the UK leaving the EU? Whom is the you, sir? I thank the member for the question. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government believes wholeheartedly that uh, the European Union membership is in the best interest of Scotland and the rest of the UK. We'll be focusing our resources on continuing to make that strongest case as possible and a positive case as possible to remain in the European Union. Many benefits uh, that we get from the European Union right now. In 2011, 336,000 jobs uh, were associated with exports to the UK, almost half of our exports uh, going to the European Union and EU funding to the tune of 1.9 billion euros affecting and uh, supporting projects right the way uh, up and down Scotland. But it's not just about the economy. We'll also be making the positive case on the social protections, the cultural associations we have with the European Union and the mutual support uh, in taking on some of the global challenges that the continent faces. Many thanks. George Adam. Does the Minister agree with me uh, that it would be extremely unjust for Scotland to be dragged out of the EU if a majority of Scots vote to stay in the EU? Is this not just another further example of how out of touch Westminster currently is? Yeah. Minister? Yeah. I agree with the member uh, again wholeheartedly. I think it would be democratically indefensible if Scotland was dragged out of the European Union against its will. We were told, of course, during the uh, run up to the Scottish independence referendum. Uh, that a, a no vote would mean that our place would not be at risk at all in the European Union. I think that has been proven to be untrue, but it would be democratically indefensible. Uh, the First Minister has been very clear that uh, if that scenario did play out, uh, then uh, they could precipitate a demand for a second independence referendum. Despite that, the First Minister has made it extremely clear that she will be campaigning uh, vociferously, robustly in Scotland, uh, for Scotland to remain within the European Union and hopes that the rest of the UK will follow suit. Many thanks. Jimmy McGregor. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's no secret that the Scottish Government is having trouble delivering the cap subsidies to farmers in Scotland. What budget would these subsidies come from if we were no longer part of the EU? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a fair point uh, to make. I mean, I, I, I've suggested this to those who believe uh, in European Union exit and Brexit. What I would say in terms of the cap farmers, uh, he'll be pleased, of course, the announcement that's been made of the Scottish Government stepping up to the mark uh, to put £200 million in place in terms of advanced payments. Uh, in regards to, to CAP, uh, for those that believe in Brexit and the EU, UK, UK exit from the EU, uh, I would struggle to believe that the UK would match the subsidy, match the support the European Union gives to farmers. So I think he makes the point very well. For farmers, uh, it is important. That's why we have uh, farmers uh, saying up and down the country that they believe, uh, and the majority of them, that European Union <coughs> membership is best for the United Kingdom. Many thanks. Uh, question two, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of the film and television industry to discuss the building of a film studio. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the film studio delivery group, comprising of Scottish Government, Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise, meet regularly to drive action on delivering a film studio for Scotland. This includes meetings with Ward Park Studios Limited, who today announce plans to expand their existing facilities in Cumbernauld to provide an additional 30,000 square feet across two new 50-foot uh, high sound studios. Uh, Scottish Enterprise and Creative Scotland, on behalf of the FD, FSDG, also meet regularly with representatives from the screen, screen industry to discuss potential proposals to develop screen facilities. And it's worth noting that Creative Scotland, as our lead agency for screen, has established the Screen Sector Leadership Group, uh, which met in December 2015 and January 2016, chaired by John McCormick. Uh, the Screen Sector Leadership Group is made up of industry representatives and will meet again in March 2016. Many thanks. Cameron McKenna. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. And these plans for a film studio in Cumbernauld are, of course, welcome. But today's announcement is only the intention to seek planning permission to extend an existing facility. There is still no major film studio in Scotland which can compete with Wales and Northern Ireland, with a filmmaker saying that this has a catastrophic effect on the industry in Scotland. The Scottish Government has already delayed a decision on the proposals for a private facility in Midlothian until after the election, despite support from local councillors of the TV and film industry. Question. Given that the Scottish Government have stated many times the critical importance of this industry in the Scottish economy, including the White Paper, will she assure us that the Scottish Government can this time turn aspiration into reality and not simply delay these important decisions any further? 
Well, all these developments and indeed the developments in other parts of the UK are private sector developed led. Uh, it is not uh, in the capabilities of ministers uh, to uh, pre-announce announcements or uh, drive actions by, by the private sector. They are in control of their own, uh, their own provisions in that regard for both the cases they refer to. I would emphasise that the Petland Studios um, uh, proposal is currently with Scottish ministers and his understanding of planning will mean that uh, I can't make any comment about that particular development. Uh, and indeed, the reason it's in, with ministers is by request by Petland Studios for a re recall appeal by the Scottish ministers. That's what's currently underway. What I can say to you is that we continue, despite the, this, uh, this very, very welcome announcement, a major milestone in development of film studio in Scotland, uh, we still are looking at different proposals and different means to expand the studio opportunities uh, for Scotland. But I can tell you now, as of now, there are four productions currently filming in studios in Scotland. We need to make sure we've got permanent uh, facilities, not just temporary. And actually, uh, I think it's a day that we can welcome the development, a major milestone in film studio development in Scotland. Thank you. Short questions and answers. The order of the day, please. Supplementary from David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Hounds and Islands has had a proud track record of being a prime location for films such as Harry Potter, Rob Roy and Monarch of the Glen. The Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that Sky has a first-class facility, a first-class built film studio in Samoa. What more can be done to advertise this first-class facility? And surely Scotland is large enough to provide two film studios? Yeah, I'm saying. Uh, in my evidence to the committee this morning, I made it quite clear that uh, Scotland has the opportunity to realise potential of uh, film production to have certainly a number of studios. And indeed, I have visited Salma Rostig, um, and obviously it's been used on a regular basis for Bannon, uh, but also for Katie Morag and indeed other productions. However, I, uh, I, I think it's very important that people are aware of the provision, the existing film studio provision at Salma Rostig, and I'll undertake to make sure we can do everything with our agencies we can to help uh, publicise it to make the most of that facility on the, on the Isle of Skye. Many thanks. Rob Gibson, question three. Thank you, <coughs> President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how traditional instrument tuition fits in with its strategy for the Scottish traditional arts. Uh, the Scottish Government primarily supports traditional music and the traditional arts through Creative Scotland, who integrate traditional arts into the broader arts strategy. The Youth Music Initiative, backed by £10 million of Scottish Government investment managed by Creative Scotland, provides a wide range of music making opportunities, including traditional instrument uh, tuition, and reached over two. 125,000 young people in 1415. And last week at the platform in Glasgow, I announced the final tranche of 1516 YMA funding being awarded to 32 organisations, including £100,000 to the National Piping Centre, over £39,000 to Hands Up for Trad to run a traditional music summer school in South Lanarkshire, and £10,000 to Shapeshifter to deliver a musical and cultural exchange between young people in the Shetland Islands, North East England, and East London. Excellent. Rob Gibson. I thank the Minister for that detailed answer. While the Youth Music Initiative offers traditional instrument tuition in some places, the delivery is uh, patchy, as is the music tuition delivered by schools. Will the Cabinet Secretary review the spread of traditional musical instrument tuition with a view to offering students in Scottish schools a chance to play and understand their own Indigenous musical riches? Yeah, the, much of the YMI is delivered in schools and indeed we're looking to refresh YMI and I will make sure that the refresh uh, acknowledges the point made by the member that we need to integrate with existing school provision and enhance existing school provision but not replace school provision in the traditional arts. Many thanks. Question four, Jamie McGregor. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it supports the historic houses and built heritage sector. Fiona the Scottish Government supports our historic environment in many ways, including historic houses and the wider built heritage. Historic Environment Scotland is charged with investigating, caring for and promoting Scotland's historic environment. We launched our first ever heritage um, uh, strategy, our place in time. The vast majority of built heritage is, of course, in private hands, and the Scottish Government expects Historic Environment Scotland to work with its partners and communities to develop a common vision and priorities uh, set out in the strategy. And uh, we recognise that that heritage continues to make a strong and growing contribution to the well-being of the nation and its people. And to that end, I'm very pleased that Lord Hopeton, Chair of the Historic Houses Association in Scotland, sits on one of the strategy's key working groups looking at heritage tourism. And I also look forward to attending the Association's reception hosted by the member here this evening. 
Many thanks. Jamie McGregor. Um, well, I'm very glad that the, the, the Minister mentioned that. Um, and all members and staff are very welcome to come to that event in Committee Room 1. Um, what extra support can the Scottish Government provide to historic houses in need of urgent repairs? And will she urge ministerial colleagues and others to redouble their efforts to promote heritage tourism in particular? Uh, heritage tourism is vitally important and I recognise that absolutely and in terms of our investment one of the things we're looking at is how do we make sure that we take a long-term view in terms of major investment that's required not just in the private sector which is the biggest sector but also with NTS and indeed Historic Environment Scotland properties despite real pressures on our budget I've managed to ensure that we've maintained the grant schemes that are available and um, building repair grants and, and other grants that are available uh, but it is a challenge but we need to see things in the round and that includes looking at things from a tourism point of view but you need to make sure the product is there that people can come and visit whether that's historic houses in the private sector or indeed those that are managed on behalf of ministers. Thanks. Question five, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it considers the benefits to Scotland are of the UK's membership of the EU. Minister Humza yeah. Yousaf. I think there's many benefits, uh, President Officer. Uh, of Scotland and the UK being in the European Union. I've, I won't rehearse uh, some of the economic uh, arguments. Uh, they're well made. I, I think sometimes we can lose fact uh, of, of the case that there's also a lot of protections and social protections in particular that benefit us here in Scotland from the right to maternity pay, paternity pay, not the right not to be forced to work more than 40 hours uh, a week, as well as not to be discriminated against in terms of your gender, your race, uh, or any other factor uh, either. So those, those uh, benefits uh, are also very important and so too the benefits where uh, independent countries can come together to take on some of the most difficult global challenges that we face uh, as a continent uh, that can be from climate change right the way through to the global refugee crisis as well so many many benefits economic social uh, and as I say coming collectively together to tackle some of the, mo the world's most difficult challenges. Many thanks can, Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Minister for his answer last Sunday I watched Boris Johnson MP Mayor of London on the television debating why the UK should leave the EU. His comments during that show reinforced my belief in voting to stay in the EU. In light of the comments Brit Exit are making, what would the Scottish Government's position be and what action would it possibly take in regard to the EU vote if England votes to leave the European Union? Minister? Mm. I mean, I don't focus much on what Boris Johnson uh, has to say, but what I've heard uh, thus far from the Leave campaign uh, has been actually very negative. Uh, we've seen some of that also from some elements of the Remain campaign. And the Scottish Government will be looking to make a very positive case about why not just Scotland, but the rest of the United Kingdom uh, should also vote to stay within the European Union. There are a number of constitutional hypotheticals. They've been asked of us and we've commented on uh, what would happen if we think if Scotland stayed within the European Union? Uh, as polls tend to, to indicate, we won't be complacent about that. We'll work hard uh, to ensure that is the case. But if the rest of the UK voted to leave, uh, I've said that it would be democratically indefensible, and the First Minister is right to say that that might well precipitate demand for a second in Scottish independence referendum. Thanks very much. Question six, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what value it places on the culture and traditions of the North East of Scotland. Secretary uh, the Scottish Government places great importance on the traditional culture, language and heritage of the North East of Scotland and it supports Creative Scotland events, Scotland and Historic Environment Scotland to promote its rich cult local culture and traditions in different ways. In 1415, Creative Scotland invested over 2.4 million in organisations and individuals based in the North East of Scotland. Under Time to Shine, £400,000 has supported the Youth Arts Collective North East Hub in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, um, giving opportunities for 1,000 uh, young a thousand opportunities young people to progress excel in the arts and last year Creative Scotland published its first Scots language policy underlining the organisation's commitment in supporting the language through its own work and the work that it funds across arts, screen and creative industries. Many thanks. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, for our ministers gang to gear a horn up to Doric. <laughs> Government Secretary. Well, I is probably the answer to that one. Uh, I think it's very important um, that uh, we provide support for our languages. Most of that is done through the language minister, Alistair Allen, and I would direct uh, the, the member's attention to himself. But in terms of culture, I would also refer the member to 
uh, the Creative Scotland website, uh, just yesterday they put a piece on about netting by Morna Young, a play currently touring. It's funded by Creative Scotland. Uh, she talks about, uh, in the interview, about writing in Doric, about netting and loss at sea. And uh, that's a, a, an important part of uh, our promotion using Creative Scotland's uh, resource. And she's also a Scots language ambassador. So that's one thing as of now that we're doing to give a hon up to Doric. Excellent. Question seven, Hans Alan Malik. Thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs will be attending any events in the iRight Festival in Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the iRight Festival in Glasgow, which is Scotland's second largest book festival, is taking place for the 11th year running. I'm sure its successes over these years will be continued. Uh, while I have no plans at present to visit the festival, it is welcoming leaders from all parties in the Parliament at separate events in the series entitled The Books That Made Me, including the First Minister, who's due to close the event on Sunday the 20th of March. Thank you. Hans Malik. Thank you very much for that response. Glasgow City Council is very proud to hold the I Write Book Festival, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary says, for the past 11 years. Uh, it has been observed that the festival has a low participation of people from ethnic minority communities as both participants and uh, contributors. Uh, even though I know personally of several Glaswegians of diverse backgrounds who have published books in the last years. And I'll just mention some of the writers in Glasgow uh, who I'm proud to know. Ahmed Raza, Aman, Bashir Man, Charan Gill, Farah Malik, Amtaz Ali Gore, Arshad Ahmed, Philomena Malik, my own mother, uh, Rahad Zahed, uh, and Nara. There are just 10 writers that I know of of Glasgow who've, who've written books yet they've not had an opportunity to participate. What is the Scottish Government going to do to increase participation in literary, literary and cultural events in Scotland for these talented people? Uh, I think the, the member makes a valid point. Um, I'm not sure about plugging his mother's book, how appropriate that is in the Parliament. However, um, what I would say is that uh, Creative Scotland has supported... supported I, I'm sure it's a wonderful book. <laughs> and it, and it, and uh, it's got, the Creative Scotland have funded uh, iWrite for £105,000. But one of the things they are doing, and I, I've asked them to do, is to look at their equalities issues to make sure that the people they fund, the organisations they fund, take on equalities issues. So since iWrite is one of the, uh, those receiving Creative Scotland funds, um, that's one way of doing that. And can I say, I don't often agree with the leader of the Labour Party in Scotland, uh, Kezia Dugdale, but her choice of A Thousand Splendid Sons as one of her favourite books, as in, in the interview, as recalled by uh, Phil Miller, is one of mine as well. So that's something perhaps we can share across the benches. Many thanks. Question eight, Jamidi. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met Creative Scotland and what matters were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Last met with the officials from Creative Scotland at the Exchange 2016 event on the 4th of March at the Platform in Easter House, uh, presented by Music for Youth. I announced £10 million to boost youth music. Uh, the event featured performances by young musicians. Uh, it's a great opportunity to network and hear about the music industry. And the YMA itself, of course, provides high quality ma music making opportunities. Uh, YMI, as administered by Creative Scotland has been a great success. Immediate. Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can she tell us what further evaluation the Scottish Government is undertaking to ensure that Creative Scotland meets its objectives and priorities as set out in their film strategy? And in particular, what progress is being made to incentivise film and TV production so that we can not only nurture homegrown talent, but encourage people from across the world to come and live and work in Scotland. Uh, I thank the member, uh, and indeed I set some of this out in the committee this morning. On top of the record level of investment of £24 million in the screen industry in Scotland in 1415, in addition to that, we've provided uh, additional funding of £4.7 million. Now, some of that, £1 million of, pounds of that is for skills development and production. Uh, some of that is for production de uh, development. Indeed, two, two films in, in particular in discussions with Creative Scotland just now. So, in terms of skills, production, development, progress is being made. And I was allowed to go into some detail on this in the committee this morning. Many thanks. 
Uh, Dave Stewart, question nine, briefly, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to support culture in the Highlands and Islands. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Highlands Youth Arts Hub received £400,000 to support uh, over 2,700 young people, and in 15-16, Creative Scotland is fun funding and supporting 69 projects across the Highlands and Islands. A number of examples, but I'm sure we're brief for time. Presiding officer. Uh, Dave Stewart. Uh, Presiding officer, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that following financial problems, Ian Court Theatre in Inverness has cancelled its SVQ qualification in drama, its star graduate being Karen Gillan, the star of Doctor Who and Guardians of the Galaxy. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any help, advice or guidance to reinstate this well-respected course? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, clearly in terms of uh, Scottish Government or agency funding, Creative Scotland uh, provides regular funding in the level of £2.1 million over that period. I'm very well, well aware of the very good work that the Eden Court carries out, including in skills and training the wider development. They're very successful in, in raising funds from a variety variety of different uh, sources, both private and indeed in revenue terms. And I think in terms of skills and training, we can perhaps look at different areas across government in terms of whether it's uh, you know, uh, in terms of skills development in Scotland or other areas to make sure that provision for drama or indeed other areas can support the very good work that Eden Court does. Many thanks. Um, we now move to portfolio questions on infrastructure investment in cities. Question one, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made on the construction of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, construction of the AWPR uh, is well underway, and we are on programme to open the road in winter 2017. Uh, we are also working closely with the contractor to ensure the successful delivery of the project, and will continue with the regular engagement with local communities and with elected representatives. Many thanks. Kevin Stewart. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer, uh, and the progress is uh, welcomed by the people of the North East, who have been waiting for this bypass since 1948, when it was first planned. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary assure me that work to further improve Aberdeen's road structure by dealing with a notorious Hadigan roundabout uh, will commence directly after the completion of the Western Peripheral Route. Can, the hey, can I thank uh, Kevin Stewart for his question and his comments. He is quite right to say, of course, there has been a very long wait for this, and I am very proud it is the Scottish Government which is delivering on this long-awaited project, albeit that initially it was a local roads project and we have taken on the responsibility working with the partners in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire councils. Uh, in relation to his question about the Hodigan Roundabout, the Scottish Government has given a clear commitment to commencing improvements at the Hodigan Roundabout following completion of the AWPR. I am sure that the member knows that the Hodigan and Bridge of D improvements could cut journey times by up to 20 per cent, and indeed the AWPR itself could cut journey times by up to 50 per cent. So these are hugely welcome developments uh, for the infrastructure of the North East. Thanks. Jackie Bailey. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Deputy First Minister announced an additional £306 million of borrowing um, following the reclassification of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route um, from, from Eurostat. Um, will this cover all of the outstanding costs of construction, or will there be a need for further borrowing in the future? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there is no further borrowing required from that which the Deputy First Minister has already announced in relation to this project. Of course, uh, the borrowing generally of the Scottish Government, whether it is the increased borrowing that we now have uh, the ability to undertake or uh, other aspects of borrowing, has been factored into this. It is very unfortunate that this has been reclassified because, of course, that crowds out potentially further projects. But the borrowing for this project has been set, and there is no question either that the uh, costs of this will either increase or that it will take longer to complete this project because of that reclassification, regrettable though it is. Thanks. Question two, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to develop transport infrastructure in Glasgow. Mr Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government is delivering over £2 billion investment in transport infrastructure in and around Glasgow, including the completion of the motorway network, improving journey times by rail between Glasgow and Edinburgh, as well as investment in the Glasgow subway, fast link and the Glasgow wider area city deal. Thanks, James Dornan. I thank the Minister for that answer. What economic benefits does uh, the Scottish Government anticipate for Glasgow as a result of that substantial investment in the city's infrastructure? Minister. This infrastructure investment is all about supporting sustainable economic growth through better connectivity, improved uh, journey times, enhanced public transport, which has to be good for business, employment opportunities, education and health care, so delivering economic recovery and uh, improving the infrastructure of our region and our nation.
Many thanks. Uh, question three, Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how its procurement processes encourage the use of local, small and medium-sized enterprises. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government will introduce legislation in June of this year requiring public bodies, when buying goods or services over £50,000 or when involved in construction-type contracts over £2 million, to conduct the procurement exercise with a view to involving SMEs as well as the third sector and supported businesses in the process. And that legislation will also require public bodies to advertise such contract opportunities on the Public Contract Scotland PCS website, thereby increasing visibility of such opportunities. PCS also allows main contractors on public sector contracts to advertise subcontract opportunities, giving smaller firms a chance to bid for contracts further down the supply chain. And when a main contractor is appointed to manage a project, they are able to use the service to identify local suppliers as a part of the Scottish Government's drive to cre create a more sustainable supply chain for public sector contracts. Can I, can, I thank, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that um, very descriptive answer? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, can I say that I've been impressed recently at a meeting with Scotland XL, who in fact just last night won a, a business award at the Procurement uh, Awards, an Innovation Award. Uh, however, I wonder too if there's a lack of understanding within public bodies as how to how local enterprise can be well used to the advantage of both the company, the local authority and indeed the area in general. And I wonder if the Scottish Government could take this on board of, of part of, as part of their progress and perhaps issue some very clear guidance as to how we can promote local companies within local communities? Well, I think the first part of my answer tried to explain to Linda Fabiani how, from the other side, the accessing of opportunities by SMEs is being helped. But she's right to point out how we can actually uh, emphasise the benefits of using local SMEs. Local authorities, of course, are responsible for their own individual procurement decisions. The government, for its part, is committed to ensuring that Scottish SMEs get a fair opportunity. But we've also developed a suite of tools to improve and standardise the public procurement process and to support SME access. And we're currently working with the Supplier Development Programme to improve opportunities for SMEs. Statutory guidance on the sustainable procurement duty, particularly relevant to the point that uh, Linda Fabiani has raised in a supplementary question, will be published shortly, and that will build on the range of tools and support available to encourage all public bodies to make contracts accessible, and will also help emphasise the extent to which employing local companies benefits the local economy. Okay, thanks. Question four, Alison McInnes. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to make infrastructure improvements north of Aberdeen. Government Secretary. The completion of the AWPR Balmeri to Tipperty scheme will provide a dual carriageway link to Ellen and provide significant travel benefits to communities and businesses north of Aberdeen within the next few years. And the transport needs of the corridor north of Aberdeen will be considered further as part of the work associated with the Aberdeen City deal, which I announced in January. The AWPR Balmeri Tipperty scheme is expected to be open in winter 2017, with the Balmeri Tipperty section scheduled to open in spring 2017. Thanks. Uh, Alison McInnes. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The, the Cabinet Secretary will, will be aware that Transport Scotland has supported Nest Trans in taking forward the Aberdeen to Fraserburgh and Peterhead multimodal study. That is a very important piece of work looking to establish the best option to improve connectivity between the key ports in the north and to the city of Aberdeen and beyond. What assurances can he give us that he will work with the city and shire and Nest Trans to deliver the outcome of that multimodal study? Well, on the 28th of January, I announced the city deal, uh, plus additional investment uh, from the Scottish Government, combined total of around £554 million, which will improve infrastructure, housing and support jobs in the North East. And as the member suggests, part of that commitment included a transport appraisal project, which will take a long-term strategic view across all modes and transport needs of the area north of Aberdeen, uh, and it will be considered in that context. The transport needs uh, will be considered as part of the City Deal Transport Appraisal, and the emerging outcomes of the Nestrans initial appraisal work will be reviewed in that context. But I could also have mentioned other uh, aspects, for example, the £170 million of investment in the railways from Aberdeen to Inverness, and of course the £3 billion plus uh, project for the uh, dueling of the A96. So a huge amount of work going on in the North East just now. Thanks. Alex Johnson. The Minister may be aware of the Why Stop at Ellen campaign, which is trying to make the case for duelling the road north of Ellen towards Peterhead and Fraserburgh. Uh, is there any prospect that the Minister may consider that out with the multimodal study that's previously been described? 
Uh, I think the, any consideration of uh, something like that project, and I'm aware of the campaign uh, surrounding that, would have to be considered in relation to the transport project uh, appraisal that's been undertaken currently. Thanks. Question five, Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what improvements have been made at Stirling Railway Station to improve the experience for passengers. Minister Derek Mackay. Stirling Station has received significant investment in passenger facilities over the past few years, and this has delivered full refurbishment of the ticket office, new ticket counters, automatic doors to the waiting areas, automatic ticket gates, two ticket machines, platform resurfacing, and new customer information screens. With its attractive layout and excellent backdrop, Stirling was chosen as the venue to mark the beginning of the new ScotRail franchise in April 2015. Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for his answer. I feel totally spoiled with that answer, I've got to say. Uh, but can the Minister please confirm that he is aware that individuals with mobility disability can face difficulties accessing some platforms at Stirling Station? Uh, could you please tell me if Stirling Council have ever made a bid to the, Stirling, to the Scottish Stations Fund to improve disability access at Stirling Station? Would he also agree with me that the, import, the huge importance of tourism to the Stirling economy, that it's important that left luggage facilities are introduced at, at the station? Would he encourage Network Rail to introduce such facilities at the earliest possible date and spoil me even more? <laughs> more than one question to uh, Minister. I will be brief then, Presiding Officer, on the left luggage issue. That is a commercial decision for uh, Abellio. And the alliance, and I would of course encourage that. I think it makes commercial sense uh, with the tourist destination uh, that is uh, Stirling. I am aware of the accessibility uh, issues, and, and, and some of that has, has UK involvement in terms of accessibility funds. But no, we have not received uh, a bid to the stations fund, uh, and I would welcome a bid, a bid uh, from uh, that uh, to be able to look at Stirling Station, because there is an issue about accessibility, disabled access. And uh, I have been working on it, as has uh, Keith Brown, and we will continue to do so. Many thanks. Question six, Chick Brodie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <coughs> uh, to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with Network Rail regarding the upgrading of the railway station at Prestwick Airport. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government has not had any recent discussions with Network Rail regarding the upgrading of the railway station at Presswick Airport, but Transport Scotland officials met with the owner on the 9th of February. Any potential upgrades to the station are the responsibility of the owner, Glasgow Presswick Airport, who operate on a wholly commercial basis and at arm's length from the Scottish Government. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer about Presswick Airport. Three years ago, a full development plan, £4.2 million pounds worth, was produced by Network Rail in concert with the owner. A, the report regarding bringing the existing railhead up to a standard anticipated and expected by tourists. It may be in a locked cabinet somewhere. Can the Cabinet Secretary ask Network Rail to now resurrect it? The Secretary. Yeah, I think I'd refer the member to that part of my first answer, which uh, explained where the responsibility lay. But uh, the 2013 Network Rail report to which he refers indicated that it would cost between four and five million pounds to bring the station up to uh, the required standard in line with an international gateway. Uh, and just to repeat the point that any future investment will be considered by the business, and I know that the member is regularly involved in discussions with Presswick Airport, but that will be considered alongside other investment demands across the Presswick Airport estate. Many thanks. Uh, question seven, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the force road bridge closure has affected the condition of roads on diversionary routes. Mr. Derek Mackay. Where possible, Transport Scotland kept diverted traffic, including HGVs, on the trunk road network to avoid disruption on local roads. For example, we utilised the pre arranged standard incident diversion route for the force road bridge using the M9, M876, A876 and A985. To keep the diversion route running freely, Transport Scotland completed additional pavement inspections during the bridge closure, and any perceived accelerated deterioration will be taken into account uh, when planned remedial works and reconstruction schemes uh, for these routes are decided in the coming months and years. The maintenance and management of local roads is the responsibility of relevant local authorities and the Scottish Government greatly appreciates their efforts during the closure period. Thank you. Mark Griffin. I thank the Minister for that answer. Can the Minister tell me if the assessment of the trunk road network has flagged up any issues with the higher than normal volume 
of traffic, particularly that extended period where HGVs were used in the routes, and also if any local authorities have um, made any claims to any additional damage to their road network that they're responsible for, and if the Minister has an indication of the, the cost to central and local government to the, to the diversions that were in place. Well, in assuming that the question really is around the, the actual condition of the carriageways, I don't have that level of detail and, and, and accelerated deterioration. But, but general wear and tear, I think, would have increased as the roads uh, were, were, were potentially more, more heavily uh, used by uh, HGVs. I, I'm not aware of any detailed claim from a local authority, but there has been ongoing engagement with the business sector, local authority and communities Another following uh, the uh, issues around the fourth road bridge. And of course, in terms of investment decisions to the future, as I said earlier in my answer, roads are inspected, remedial works and reconstruction are programmed on the basis uh, of need. And it's on that basis that we will proceed. Okay, many thanks. Question eight, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to increase active travel. Minister Derek Mackay. We are increasing our investment in active travel with the annual budget for walking and cycling in 2015-16 at record levels and 70% higher than in 13-14. This funding has helped deliver 330 miles of new paths and a further 95 miles upgraded or resurfaced between April 2011 and April 2015. In addition, 40.1% of schools now offer Bikeability Scotland on-road cycle training, up from 31.5% in 2010. Thank you. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Minister for that uh, answer. Scottish canals are currently upgrading towpaths across Scotland, including the path on the Union Canal in my constituency between Ratho and Hermiston that will benefit walkers and cyclists. Does, does the Minister agree that investment of this type is desirable, not only in reducing carbon emissions, but also improving health, fitness and well-being? Minister. Yes, I entirely agree with Mr Macdonald. I started off the, the ministerial week, as it happens, a visit to a canal looking at regeneration opportunity, uh, regeneration investment. And so it's good for healthy lifestyles, the environment, and of course, economic opportunity. So I absolutely concur with what Mr Macdonald has said. And I think uh, Scottish canals are doing a very good job with the, 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 the settlement and the resources uh, that they have. Many thanks. Question nine, Michael McMahon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on RNT Union Commission report the economic benefits of public sector ferry provision on lifeline services in the Clyde and Hebrides. Minister. The Scottish Government fully recognises that Scotland's ferry services provide economic benefits to our island communities and we're fully committed to the continued delivery of safe, reliable, publicly owned ferry services as evidenced by the record £1 billion investment in these services, vessels and ports since 2007. Michael McMahon. I thank the uh, Minister for his response. And, and can I uh, point the, the Minister to the, the con conclusion in the report which suggested how damaging uh, the privatisation of the, the ferry services in the Clyde and Hebrides would be uh, should the, the tender process go to circle. So can I ask him if he's also aware that prior to the, the Scottish Government overturning North Lanarkshire Council's decision to reject the planning development uh, proposed by Peter D. Stirling in my constituency, Transport Scotland officials had approached a freight transport company in my constituency to encourage them to speak to that developer before they had been given planning permission in order to take advantage of the potential privatisation of the Hebrides ferry services uh, and pushing them towards Circle. How can Transport Scotland officials talk to a private company and advise them to speak to another private company to take advantage of a decision that hasn't yet been made? Minister. Well, <coughs> presiding officer, can I say, first of all, I have no direct knowledge of the secondary issue that's raised, but I have do have very deep concerns about the accusation that's been made about Transport Scotland uh, officials, very deep concerns indeed. But in terms of the ferries issue, this government has invested substantially uh, in ferries, including, of course, the, the procurement of two new ferries that will be built in Scotland at uh, Ferguson's. But when it comes to the tender process, 
Mr McMahon, of all people, is well aware that the previous executive undertook a tender process. In fact, I'm fairly sure Mr McMahon said to not undertake this process would have been dangerous and risky in itself, and we put the services at risk. Well, we are not putting the services at risk. The vessels will stay publicly owned. We will continue to set the fares uh, and the timetables, and will continue to invest in the ferry services of Scotland. We will comply with the law, but I think the people of the islands know that when it comes to the islands, this government has delivered on ferries, on RET, on enhancements to aviation as well, and a whole range of areas, and we will continue to deliver for the public services of our island communities. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions, and we'll now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 158 